For the vast majority of the time that humans have been on Earth, weather was considered to be a supernatural phenomenon. There was the only explanation we could come up with was supernatural. And so there were religions that built up around that concept, really reaching their maturity in the Babylonian Empire, this idea of astrometeorology, that if you read the stars right, you could determine what was going to happen on Earth. Which I realize is it sounds a little bit like what climate scientists do today, but we're not priests, we're actually scientists. Take my word for it. But that journey to science started in ancient Greece. Now, this is sort of the traditional way of doing things. I feel obliged to point out that we say this because it's where we have the earliest evidence. It's not to say that it didn't happen first somewhere else, but it's certainly where we can say with confidence that it happened early. And whilst for up until this point, everybody was explaining things with supernatural events, there was one person in particular who decided that maybe there was something else at play. Maybe there were natural explanations. This guy's Thales of Miletus. He was a really interesting guy. He traveled all over the Mediterranean, attempting to explain things that he saw. For example, when he saw the Nile flooding, he rejected the hypothesis that it was a god causing the Nile to spill its banks and flood the floodplains. He said that, no, 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 that's nonsense. What's happening is the wind is causing the Nile to back up, and then when that wind is reversed, it spills forth. Which is complete nonsense, but it was a start. It was the first attempt to explain things without gods pulling the strings. And he was the first natural philosopher, and some people would say he was the first Greek philosopher, which means that this is a scientific discipline that has its roots going back to the very origins of how we consider modern knowledge. This isn't a modern field like I think a lot of people think meteorology and climate science is. This has been there since the beginning. And as I say, that beginning that distinction was the naturalistic theories. But he wasn't the only Greek in town. The person who was the most influential meteorologist in history was Aristotle. Aristotle actually gave us the word meteorology. He divided the knowledge of all things that happened in the sky between things that happened within the atmosphere, meteorology, and things that happened beyond the atmosphere, which was astronomy, and divided it into spheres, which was inspired by this idea of the uh, Anaximander system of having the classical elements. You had earth that sat on top of, uh, sat beneath water, sat beneath air, which sat beneath fire. And you had these different spheres that he pulled together in this book called Meteorologica, and explained these different phenomena with the exhalations of wet and dry vapors. So you may think that sounds familiar. It's basically the concept of evaporation and heat transfer. And unfortunately, whilst that idea is kind of correct, it stuck around in its original form for a very long time. If you actually read histories of the subject, quite often there's a big gap that then follows what Aristotle was doing, and then picks up in the Renaissance. But when I was researching my book, I actually found there was this place called Not Europe. And there's actually more of it than that, believe it or not. Um, and there is this big gap in the history, but some really interesting things happened after Aristotle had those original ideas. In particular, the first writings on climate change, there was a polymath scholar in uh, China called Sheng Kuo, who around the year 1000 noticed that there was bamboo growing, sorry, there was petrified bamboo in a region where bamboo didn't grow anymore. And he hypo hypothesized that maybe the climate had changed and that things used to be warmer in the past. The first time, as far as we can tell, that anyone in the world had considered that. There were huge advances in mathematics, notably the concept of zero and the idea of algebra. And in particular, what I think is really cool, the first time that anybody estimated how tall the atmosphere was. To give you a little bit more detail on that, um, this was done by someone in Andalusia called Ibn Muad, and they estimated the height of the atmosphere using twilight. Not the terrible book series, but the idea that after sunset, there's a certain amount of time when the atmosphere is illuminated. And they drew this distinction of twilight starts when the sun sets, as you see it at sea level, and twilight stops when you reach night, when the top of the atmosphere is no longer illuminated by the sun. In other words, when, at the uh, point H at the top of this diagram, the sun has also set. And then, using some fancy new trigonometry, you can calculate an angle, and if you have an estimate of the radius of the Earth, you can pull together an estimate of the height of the atmosphere, which he did, and found it to be about 
52 miles, which is not bad, considering that he was eyeballing it and using the idea of twilight. Today, I mean, actually, quite where the top of the atmosphere is is a very loose question. The, 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 the most generally agreed upon answer is 100 kilometers. The reason for that is twofold. Firstly, there's an astronautical reason to do with beyond that height, you're in orbit, whereas beneath it, you can sustain yourself with wings. The main reason is 100 kilometers is a really nice round number, and we've got to pick something. But the other answers would include 10,000 kilometers, which is where the gravitational attraction of molecules to the Earth is beaten out by the pressure of the solar wind. Various different places you could put it. So 100 kilometers, that's about 84 kilometers. Not bad, Ibn Muad. But to actually return to Europe, it became the center of sort of the development of atmospheric science with a bunch of really rapid fire developments. And this happened in the Renaissance. The Renaissance was arguably spurred on by the discovery of the Americas, and it created this perfect storm, if you pardon the pun, for meteorology. It created wealth that could finance scientists. Those scientists could do experiments. One of the things that held back natural philosophers in ancient Greece was that they didn't have the concept of an experiment because an experiment was seen as manual labor. And, and natural philosophers were gentlemen who didn't do nat manual labor. So that advance was new and incredibly important, as was the mathematics developed in the rest of the world. The part that I think a lot of people miss is the development of glass. So glass had been around since the ancient Phoenicians. It's something that's been around for thousands of years. But for most of its history, it was very brittle. It was uh, opaque. You couldn't really use it for very much. But Venetian glassmakers in the 15th century realized that if you added some ash from certain kinds of plants to it, you could make it transparent, you could make it much more rigid, and you could use it to isolate parts of the world. You could use it to isolate parts of the atmosphere. And that meant that you could create instruments. In particular, the two instruments that were most important were the thermoscope, which was developed in part by Galileo, amongst other people, that became the thermometer, the difference being a thermoscope will tell you if something is warmer or cooler, not an absolute temperature. And the other one was measuring pressure, the barometer, which was developed by Evangelista Torricelli, who was one of Galileo's students. And the key thing to stress here is that whilst this all sounds quite modern, this, is, this all sounds like a very modern idea of meteorology, this was still considering whether to be in situ. What I mean by that is considering that the weather in over London, for example, was only determined by things that happened in London. So what the temperature was here, what the pressure was here, weather was localized. And that was an idea that persisted until the great storm of 1703. Now, this was an event that was probably even larger than Storm Eunice. This was an event that caused, I can't remember the figure off the top of my head, but thousands of fatalities. Boats were recorded as being blown miles inland. The lead was blown off of Westminster Abbey's roof. This was a huge weather event. And it caught the attention of Daniel Defoe, who you may know as the author of Robinson Crusoe, but had an absolutely fascinating life. Uh, this guy was a, a bricklayer. He uh, was an uh, insurance collector, I think, at one point. He was in and out of prison for various bad behavior. And one day, after leaving prison, he saw this storm happen. And he thought that something really interesting was going on. So he put out a call in the newspapers of the UK and Western Europe to say, if you've got any stories from this thing, send them in to me, tell me what date it happened, and I'll write it up which he did. He wrote up a book called, well, amazing title, The Storm or a Collection of the Most Remarkable Casualties and Disaster Which Happened in the Last Dreadful Tempest, Both by Sea and Land. Titles have come a long way since then. And what this was was arguably one of the first pieces of modern journalism. He identified all of these different stories and their location and their times and realized that the storm was the same storm in the UK as hit France, as hit the Netherlands, as hit Germany. And it was a weather system that evolved and moved over Western Europe. Clearly, it wasn't in situ. The weather that happened somewhere else influenced the weather that happened here.